ready. Yeah. Okay. So um, we wanted to talk about the events um, that are happening in our country for the last couple of weeks, but also um, these events kind of signal to much deeper issues. And it's always hard to talk about social issues in relation to architecture. I feel like we don't have a lot of practice doing that. Um, so we wanted to kind of set the stage and, you know, just Mark and I have a conversation about that and we welcome, welcome anybody else who wants to join as well. So I just wanted to start by recognizing and noting that, you know, we are in the middle of a pandemic. Everybody is really um, struggling. A lot of people are struggling because of loss of livelihood. Others are really mourning the loss of loved ones. And it's a really hard time for everybody involved. And then in the midst of that, we have a series of events that took place, um, you know, first in Central Park and also with regard to Ahmad Arbery, where fellow citizens confronted Black Americans and in one case, you know, chased and shot the person down simply for running down a street. Um, then we had Breonna Taylor, who, you know, because of a mis like almost like an administrative error, plain clothes policemen enter a house and just shoot a person down. And, and then finally, we had kind of the thing that broke the dam, it seems, in terms of, uh, you know, the protests and people just standing up and, and saying, enough is enough. Um, with George Floyd, where for eight minutes and 46 seconds, kind of this excruciatingly long time, we see an agent of the state, somebody that uh, is ostensibly working for the taxpaying citizens, including the one who, um, whose neck is under his knee, you know, um, kind of acting out a kind of injustice, which in a way is kind of an emergency signal for the entire country that reflect, that kind of um, reveals deeper and long-standing issues of discrimination, of injustice, and so forth. And, you know, I just want to say here that um, anybody watching this, anybody part of this meeting or watching this later on YouTube, if you want to engage in these conversations, uh, we welcome you. Just reach out to us, especially if you are from a minority community, if you are from the Black community, reach out to us. We understand this is a hard time. Maybe this is not the right time. Uh, maybe this is not the place where you know everybody has the capacity to educate and have this conversation but we want to do our part to be allies in this movement and uh, to recognize that this is a responsibility that lies with everybody in a democracy right so just want to ask mark um you know what was your reaction what have you been feeling what have you been doing over the last two weeks um and yeah just open that that space up yeah, so as a kind of less articulate of the two co-hosts, <laughs> thank you, one, for uh, being able to say that so eloquently. Um, so the last two weeks for me have been, a re and this is, I mean, it's embarrassing to some degree, like a kind of like uh, awakening or like realization of like how, m how much I've kind of, not actively, but passively kind of ignored uh, the kind of discussions about race uh, in our country and in our discipline and uh, and practice of architecture right so I think um, it's been a it's been a lot of kind of trying like frantically in a way trying to consume information and like educate myself um, while realizing that this is uh, again like sort of like reactionary response and that it uh, although it's good, it needs to, it needs to, um, you know, not be, it needs to last longer than um, the next few weeks or months, right? It's a kind of a lifetime um, goal to kind of remain educated and, and understand these things. So in the last couple of weeks, um, I've been reading various posts, uh, trying, I, I am staying with my family. Uh, my parents are both elderly, so I haven't been able to get into the kind of middle of, of, a, of a protest, but I've attended uh, 
one uh, and a community cleanup and I've been doing some um, readings and yeah, I've read like a couple books and I've been pushing my family members uh, to, to read uh, things, uh, which I think we could talk about. Um, because I, for me, um, I don't know, I, I think I'm like also coming to terms with like how white and like privileged like my upbringing was like even though it didn't necessarily um i don't know why it's never really occurred to, i mean i've gone to like you know private catholic school from preschool through high school and then private universities for college and graduate school um and and yeah it's just kind of like uh coming to terms with uh with that um yeah how about you? frustrating things for me has been that i haven't been able to go out and protest even though i really want to because my mom is a heart patient and i see her three times a week like i have this schedule going and we're kind of so worried that just the little like the tiniest bit of like mistake somewhere is going to lead to like a life-threatening situation and so i feel like a lot of people are out there who are wondering like how can we help what can we say that can help the situation? So, you know, the, the enormous protests that we see outside are amazing and a great show of solidarity. But I feel like there's, an, there's additional solidarity that exists outside of, inside people's homes at this point. Um, I've been watching, I've been talking to my mom about this obviously, and kind of, as she's, she came to the US in 2017. So she's fairly new to like politics and, the social kind of fabric. And uh, we watched Trevor Noah's um, 20 minute video about talking about the social contract and how for one segment of society, black, of Amer black Americans, it seems that the contract is broken, right? So how do, we, how do we make sure that it is upheld for everybody equally? And uh, she asked me like, did you watch the video? And I said yes, but you know, I actually have not watched the full video. Like I, don't, I can't bring myself to watching that long of a process of uh, pain. But, and then she asked me like, what happened? Like, why did they call the police? And I was like, well, he was accused of using a $20 bill that was counterfeit. And she was like, oh no, like um, they killed him for $20. And that to me was really like, it just, distilled that whole event in a really poignant way. Um, so, so yeah, that's like some conversations I've been having and like, it's, inter it's, it's harrowing to hear people's stories of everyday events that don't make the news, right? Where mm -hmm. people are not killed, but are just humiliated or stopped and treated differently or um, treated aggressively, but somehow live and survive that, but live with the uh, psychological, um, you know, damage that results from that. And the fear, like, I can't imagine um, being in a situation where you would be afraid for your life uh, when you encounter a police officer or when you walk out on the streets. So that's uh, some things I've been thinking about. Um, how does this relate to architecture? Like, We've been hearing a lot of statements from schools, from um, you know architecture companies. People have been talking about historic discrimination in housing. Um, so, any thoughts on that, Mark? Well, yeah, I think like um, I mean, we've discussed a little bit about this, so it's not uh, not to like take ownership of these ideas, but I think that it's really on these kind of. I mean, all of us, but uh, added pressure to these institutions, to like universities, uh, museums, and us as architects to really push for inclusion, right? So I think, and but there's also like, um, basically I see it as like architects are designers and makers, right? So there are ways of addressing, um, these issues through what we make and what we produce. And then sort of the institutions or structures that prop us up, meaning like challenging uh, our employers, uh, people. 
that um, that basically are like employers, collaborators, and uh, ultimately like academic institutions that kind of uh, are intricately involved in this, right? So there's kind of there's that, and then there's also like kind of like prof so okay, I'd say there's discipline, the profession, like practice, discipline, meaning like uh, schools, offices, and then kind of like interpersonal work that I think we can address, and then uh, like our own actual design work, right? So ideally, we're trying to, <laughs> I don't know, promote um, and dismantle some of these, like promote uh, people of color and also dismantle some of these kind of systemic systems, systemic systems that oppress people. See, I can't even talk about this, like embarrassing because I don't even have the language, like all these words are also new to me, right? And that's, <laughs> it's a- uh, Dismantle is a very interesting word because like, you know, along with Andy in our studio, we've been thinking about social issues for a long time, yeah. but we've kind of been working a lot within institutions and partnering with institutions. And we've seen our role as like pushing them just enough to be able to make pragmatic changes. And suddenly, like you said, it seems the conversation has jumped forward like a lot where we find ourselves like, okay, now what do we do? What is our role in this situation, right? So, I mean, dismantling is really, an interesting word because it reminds me of um, like I read just finished um, how to do nothing um, by Jenny Odell mm -hmm. and ends the book with uh, a, a, an example of dismantling where the San Clemente Dam in California uh, which was built in the early 20th century was posing a real um, risk to the communities downstream because of earthquake, um, you know, concerns. Um, it had, of course, for decades also kind of destroyed the ecosystems and the ability of fish to go up and down the river stream. And then California decided to do a project, a design project that cost $80 million that essentially involved a whole lot of design and engineering to remove this dam. And before they were able to remove it, they had to reroute the river. And so years of time were spent and lots of money was spent to kind of take away this thing that was a huge barrier to like uh, the safety of people and the ecology of the land. And so that to me is something totally new because as architects or as an architect, I always feel like we need to build something, we need to fix something, we need to add something to the conversation. Like, and the question for me is like, how can we begin to think carefully about the built environment that already exists? Um, so many buildings are vacant right now because people are working from home. Like, is there a way to reorient um, their use and kind of design how people, um, how people uh, inhabit them? So, but yeah, and the institutional conversation is a, is a longer one about how do we ensure uh, more equal representation. Uh, Mark, I know you and I have talked about the role of funding, the enormous uh, wealth inequality in the country and how many of our institutions, even though they have you know, really great missions, are often beholden to um, where the funding is coming from. Mm -hmm. and that has a huge impact as well. So as we think about the emergency responses, you know, um, how can we also begin to think about the, the long range of time and the much bigger sums of resources that are needed to enact these changes? Um, it's something I've been thinking about. Yeah, and I think this is like maybe specific, <laughs> um, but related to you know our work at, in teaching. I know Jessica and Charles are professors as well. So I, I, I was teaching uh last fall a course um uh, basically it was a we had a lot of architecture precedents that we were looking at right and i was like careful to try to include a sort of like 
gender diversity and as much diversity as possible but there's really a problem that we're facing in architecture which is like all the stuff like the canon and all the stuff that we're looking at in schools is, are like white like primarily white men right and that like there's um i don't know it's just it's a it's a kind of like i think like an easy first step would be to broaden that and have our students or have each, like each other look at look at work outside of uh, European centric architecture, which I think like even in this, I mean, we've been doing this conversation series for like three weeks, <laughs> three and a half, uh, but we're we're also guilty of that, right? And and I think um, I don't know that might be a place to kind of be again our, our conversation even with how what we're gonna do uh yeah that's something we've definitely been talking about with starting to have conversations with our school and the students and even the places we graduated from starting to talk about i mean exactly what you're saying the kind of like eurocentric education that we all went through and now as educators it's like especially young educators you're just kind of learning how to teach and how to best engage with students and then on top of that you're trying to, you know, change what you learn kind of fundamentally to be able to educate students in the um, in the best way that you can and make give them kind of a diverse set of references or um, you know different opportunities or open up different conversations. And I think one conversation I know the faculty at University of Arkansas kind of overall has been having is how much it's kind of um, it's challenging for the faculty, but and it's also you know, we're not really trained in this way. So even just having the conversations about race in the classroom can be, you know, a difficult starting point also. So I know that's definitely a big, a big thing, you know, we want to work on. And just like you've been saying, Mark, you know, we feel like we're catching up on terms pretty much every two hours. We're like, well, that kind of dismant we saw something on Instagram that we're like, okay, well, I guess we were thinking about that wrong. We need to think about it, you know, a different way, or there's other ways to think about it than the way that we were we were maybe taught to yeah I, mean, do, I think yeah i think it's I, I feel i mean i feel clumsy when i speak regularly but uh <laughs> with this it's just completely um i don't know disorienting but i think it's important um really quickly before you guys enter the conversation i should probably introduce you to uh to, <laughs> to the group so i've done a little I mean, it's pulled from, if anybody would like to visit uh, somewherestudio.com, but basically, um, so we met at, at Princeton, Jessica and I were classmates, but um, this is Jessica Colangelo, and Charles, I've never said your last name, but it's Sharpless, right? Yes. Okay, I mean, it, I could pronounce it right. Uh, so Jessica and Charles run Somewhere Studio, and you're current, are you guys in Arkansas right now, or where have you been throughout this? Yeah, we're in, Ar in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Okay. Um, and you're both teaching at the University of Arkansas. Um, like I said, Jessica went to Princeton University and received a master's in architecture and bachelor of architecture from Rice and Charles, uh, master of architecture from GSD um, and bachelor of architecture from Rice as well. So you guys met at Rice, mm -hmm. but then also both worked at Lorcan in Los Angeles mm -hmm. after, okay. after school though. Okay, I was trying to figure out where you, where the first um, meeting point was. Uh, but okay, yeah, so your guys practice, uh, you do kind of research and built work and um, and our educators, which is a kind of like uh, exciting thing, I don't know, for us to engage in. Uh, and you guys have won like so many awards. You got so much press for the salvage swings. I was like trying to make a list of all of them, but uh, I would, consult the website, uh, but you've also been uh, published in a variety of uh, journals and magazines, Arcane, Interior Design Magazine, Arconnect, The New York Times, uh, Rumor Reviews. Um, so very exciting work and uh, I had the pleasure of swinging on, on your swing. So actually uh, inhabiting one of the uh, first early, early works of, of Somewhere Studio. So we're happy to have you. I like early work. It was like last year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. Yeah. 
That's good though. The definition of young architects is very, very open in, in the field. Talk about like MoMA PS1 and stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, I didn't realize that the shapes of the swings were actually the exact cutouts of the openings between the various um, modules. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, it was cool and we, cause we did that originally as like a materials, well, it was an idea to say materials and we just thought it was clever, but then the kids, when they were there, they would hang up the swings, like put them away in the windows. So that was kind of cool. Unexpected. <laughs> Unexpected. Uh, everyone, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so should we get into some of the conversation about uh, comparing the two projects and then maybe it'll lead back or at any point to current events and, and stuff like that. Um, so, we're, we're talking about the Shelter Shift project um, by Somewhere Studio. And it's um, two bus shelters. And uh, we have a number of images. And the project that we're comparing it to is Cloud Seeding by Modu Studio. And both in a way are kind of pavilions. You could consider them almost, well, they are mobile in the way that they play with light and views, but they're also mobile in the way that they can literally be kind of lifted and moved to another location. I know that your other project, um, was also kind of relocated after New York into another location, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, how, I guess before we get into kind of the deeper questions, like how did your studio come about and how did you arrive at some of these projects? Um, well, we, I mean, we met, obviously we were undergraduates at Rice and, um, kind of knew, I guess, early that we wanted to, to try to work together. So we had, we did some competitions together when we were students at Rice. We did a competition for a, a park in Austin. Um, and then later after we graduated from Rice, Charles went to Harvard and we kind of kept doing competitions and um, just collaborated together well and um, we're having some success in kind of ideas competitions. Um, and then after, after Charles went to, sorry, it's probably too long. After Charles went to Harvard, we moved to Los Angeles um, to get some kind of professional practice experience at Lorcan O'Hurlihy. And Charles worked at Michael Maltzen Architecture for a while. And, um, you know, following that, we felt like it would be, you know, it was kind of our goal to become both educators and to start a small practice where we could really do projects that, you know, we really believed in and that could, you know, bridge being more experimental. Um, and that we could, you know, ideally, you know, choose the projects we wanted to take on and wouldn't be so kind of financially tied to it. Mm -hmm. um, so that was kind of our goal. So that's what we're trying to do. Um, but I think, I mean, really, I mean, I would say like our formal office started just in 2017. So just a couple of years ago, that's when we really named it Somewhere Studio and tried to, you know, start uh, taking on projects more seriously. And um, we won this City of Dreams competition in uh, early 2019, so just 2018. Uh, 2018. Um, and so that was really exciting for us and we felt like a big break. And so doing the Salva Strings project in New York, we felt like really kind of, um, you know, started to start, really started to start the practice and the conversation between us just in terms of actually building a built object in public realm, so. Yeah, yeah so, so I mean, throughout our few conversations that we've had already we've been talking about the kind of like beginning of a practice and what young architects are like sort of start with to to do that so, so a lot of people will start with art or furniture drawings um competitions which you've already named uh but i guess given the two projects this kind of typology of the pavilion or a folly uh could also be seen as a kind of uh you know prototype for i don't know new kinds of ideas within architecture or or kind of like statements about your office's own identity so do you see it as 
as such, like the, you know, uh, shelter shift or um, the salvage swings? Like, do you, did you feel a kind of pressure to make a statement with your early projects or was it not as uh, <laughs> thought through? <laughs> well, there's always um, a sort of pressure you put on yourself to do something that uh, is good um, and, and not boring. Uh, so, so I think there, there's always like an internal drive to kind of uh, to do something that, you know, can, that impresses yourself. But um, I don't know, I think for us, like, and you were talking about pavilions, like the idea that a pavilion is kind of a proto architecture, it's like in between a, a furniture or in a building, um, is useful for starting a practice um, for very practical reasons because it's you know small and something that a couple people can build or put together and deliver, um, and it you know starts to engage all of the sort of exterior um, factors that architecture has to engage. So so it's like kind of a practice building uh, or like practices in a sort of warm up um, that obviously is helpful with the pavilion, but I think you know, for us mostly more than that there either is like an aesthetic statement or, um, you know, some sort of uh, like, let's say, um, uh, construction experimentation. Um, it's, it's as much a kind of experimentation and process for us and sort of how, how to move from a kind of idea to, um, to a construction. And so, and how, you know, these ways that we kind of work to realize projects that I guess maybe we don't always talk about in, in school because we're looking kind of at the finished thing or the drawings that maybe originated the project. But, um, but in both projects, uh, this kind of um, sort of uh, troubleshooting that occurs to kind of build a project and, and kind of going through and solving all of these issues um, that are required for the realization of a project that for us was kind of the establishment of a, of a method that um, I think was helpful. Um, what I really like about both of these projects that uh, I also pulled up some images of the, the swing project since we're talking about it. Um, what I really like about them is that there is a um, economy to the materials even to the forms it seems and yet with that modularity and with that simplicity, there is a very unique and custom public moment and space and views that are being constructed. And that to me is um, quite special because, you know, clearly we're looking at, um, you know, the early, as Mark said, you know, the early projects of a studio, but, and yet there is a great, um, creativity in bringing together these simple um, ways of putting material together in order to create a public space. Yeah, so I mean, I super really appreciate you saying that because that is something we've been thinking about a lot and that we've really been trying to figure out. Um, we've kind of been talking about it internally called like bargain hunting or something like this idea of how can you just use kind of simple means like the bus stops actually it looks kind of complex, but it's really just um, like off the shelf kind of metal bar stock and angle iron that was just cut, you know, to size. So it's not actually like, there's no complex folding or parametrics or anything like that. Um, so we've been trying to think about these ways to engage kind of, I don't know, just like everyday construction techniques, um, but in a way to make them kind of, yeah, exciting or kind of um, seem different than than, or less ordinary, and I guess it's kind of like a Venturian approach. But. Sure, but another thing I guess that is common in both of them that you mentioned that we definitely talk about is the idea that a, a module can create difference or like in salvage swings every box is the exact same um, in this you know every sort of angle is the exact same except how it's cut and so we, we do look for um, efficiencies, I guess, in, in how we can put things together and um, to, to try to create those moments of, of difference and those kind of surprises. Yeah. And do you think that the kind of like playfulness or participatory intentions are 
an effort to engage the kind of public in disciplinary conversation. And, and to add to that, like, I guess generally given, like even before the last couple of weeks, uh, you know, with coronavirus and everything, I've really been questioning like what, what role do these do the kind of, and I think they are important, so it's not dismissing it, but like what role do these kind of like font, like kind of like, uh, like architecture play, what does that, what does that mean today? Like what, what's, what's its kind of importance? Is something I've been I've been really questioning because I I think like my own work is you know aesthetically driven and interested in kind of like performative and and fun stuff but I I don't know I wonder if you have, you guys have been thinking about that at all like do, do you find it do you find these things to be didactic in a way for Sometimes, like, I think the Savage Wings Pavilion was very didactic, at least when we, I mean, it didn't, not to everyone, but like when we talked about literally it's salvaged wood, like people really engage in that story and like talking about recycling, you know, building waste. Um, so I think in like that way, it's kind of an end to talking about some, you know, more, maybe more serious like environmental um, challenges, but it can also at the surface level just be more fun. So I think there's kind of, you don't have to engage in that dialogue if you're not, you know, if you don't want to, but it's there to have kind of a, a more robust conversation. I think with the bus stop, I mean, what was most exciting about that project for us was just that, I mean, it was in a really generic public place. I mean, it's in Athens, Georgia, where I actually grew up in Watkinsville, Georgia, which is kind of um, like a suburb of Athens. Um, but it's on like one is in front of an egg pro like a tractor store on a kind of multi lane road so like a really busy road and the other ones in front of a beauty supply store and across from a police station. And so they're both I don't know, and just really kind of ordinary um, situations and I think they look somewhat out of place. Um, but we I mean we like the idea that you know it might be something that you would engage or if you were in a museum or something, you would probably engage it or, or see it and view it very differently than if you just were kind of on your everyday commute and then you're like, you know, what is this? Like, um, and so, I mean, in that way, like we see that as like a, another audience for, it, for, for them to engage and hopefully something that we, I mean, we really hope it just brings some people like delight and, you know, it'll be something kind of fun and memorable um, um, for them right now. If I'm talking to you. Yeah. But right now we're working on another bus stop um, in St. Louis um, with some nonprofit organizations that's even simpler in construction. It's like a wood kind of trellis construction, um, but it's in a kind of primarily black neighborhood in North St. Louis. Um, uh, and it that project is really exciting to us because it's for an audience that isn't really used to similar to this bus stop like not used to having kind of architects design for them like i feel like architecture is usually you know saved for kind of like wealthier audiences so we like these projects that kind of engage different groups and um you know sometimes they'll tell us like this is you know, are you sure this is for our neighborhood like yeah. you know it's like with yeah <laughs> with, with, even like with salvage swings roosevelt island the audience that normally hung out at that park uh literally somebody said to us this is um he said, this is Williamsburg shit. We don't, nobody does stuff like this for yes. us at Roosevelt yeah. Island like this. Um, and so, you know, the idea that architects can work in these contexts that aren't maybe um, used to getting attention from the kind of culture and design communities um, that we normally work with, uh, you know, that's that's kind of powerful. And, and then, you know, being able to be playful about it is, or, you know, having an engaging audio object um, is that much more rewarding, I suppose, for yeah. us. A lot of times, um, these objects of public intervention tend to be about social control of like surveillance or like uh, funneling people into a space. And it's rare to see um, objects of public spaces that are designed to invoke joy, this feeling of freedom and being carefree and just laughter. 
And I think that there is such a great value to bringing that to parts of the country that don't see high architecture or don't see those ideas that, you know, you can trace the pavilion back to John Haydock, who's done these really exciting projects, some of which are even hard to like find. The books are so expensive, you can't even see those projects. Um, or Kulhas or Shumi, you know, working on uh, Parc de la Villette. And, uh, you know, Mark and I were discussing that some of those, that idea of this, this joyful like pavilion, this quirky, funny thing that appears in space is uh, reminiscent of that uh, tradition in a way, but here reinvented to a work within the economic and bureaucratic whatever structures that exist to actually make it possible and be just in a totally um, different context, different urban context. So I guess one question I also have with regard to like um, the, the two of your projects is the presence of a graphic element. So almost like a hatching or pattern. You also mentioned the lenticular fins of the bus, uh, the bus shelters that is referencing or is reminiscent of a billboard. You know, where did those ideas come from? Yeah, I mean, we, we like color. Uh, and, and then also, we found that when you're designing an object, um, we were, we, we, we've been talking about color a lot in terms of we were, one thing we were talking about the other day was like on an, in an interior, we really like to paint the walls white so that all of your stuff like our books and uh, art and stuff, I don't know, the color of the things around it kind of come to fore or, you know, white as a color usually is useful to bring out um, the context and or the sort of existing colors around. Um, but with these two projects where they do have a bit of an object like quality and they um, have a lot to compete with visually, um, color becomes this kind of nice way to um, make, it, make, make it stand out. Um, but I think also uh, with both, I don't know, like luckily in salvage swings, the, the wood has a kind of rich tone to it and by striping it, you kind of, you don't have to see, um, it's not pure, you're not covering the whole wood. So there's still like grain, wood grain running behind the stripe and you kind of see through it and it creates a new tone, um, starts to play with shadows, but then it also alters the kind of surface of the wood. Um, I think that that's super interesting, the, uh, the sort of like scale or size of these, uh, of of what an architect designs might indicate uh you know color for it or like basically what you were saying was that if you were building a building it might be w like white or bl like less vibrant right. right but the smaller something gets the more like an object the more color color is at play yeah yeah and, and oh this is a good one um <laughs> Because we were behind a John Deere dealership, um, which is also like driven the color that they like have that color green patented. Um, but um, but but they were they were actually really upset. They were like, "Why did you make it yellow and oranges? Why didn't you make it green and yellow?" Yeah, <laughs> but we also didn't know the site beforehand on this. We just knew Athens picked the site like the week before. Um, oh, that's interesting. They were delivered. Um, so. Um, but uh, but actually, like so, color for the bus stop was great because um, it, it really actually the challenge of paint, putting multiple colors on on a single piece of metal drove the detailing, and so um, they had this kind of crazy setup in the fabrication shop where they like had hung all of the slats um, and were like kind of painting them separately, and basically with the screws and the connections, um, instead of asking for them to mask each side of the of the fin basically we created a sandwich so that it's really like an angle iron with two pieces of metal bar attached to it so like the three pieces are all just painted a different color and so there's no 
Um, so there's no masking involved. And so in that way, like the color actually becomes a uh, technical sort of detailing hurdle or opportunity um, that kind of starts to drive, I think, how, how you design the project. That's interesting. And it's like, I, I was also thinking about when looking at this in comparison to the um, Madu, how do you say Madu project? Uh, yeah. Basically the uh, like ma maintenance of, of these things yeah. is, is kind of interesting, especially when like color is introduced, but for the kind of like mi white minimalist project, like how, how do you keep that glass ceiling clean with all those plastic balls up there? Like that, it must, it must, not, right within a couple of days yeah. and I think like the introduction of color or were your things powder coated or how they were shot painted They're, yeah it's just it's kind of a conventional paint that comes out of a spray gun um, and, yeah because I just wonder like what how they kind of a how these things age as well yeah. right and I think that that's also linked to like kind of like uh less permanent quality maybe of of uh pavilions like that they don't have to last forever uh yeah. i don't know if you guys have any thoughts on like kind of like time span or like life yeah of 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 your work or you know i think like also colors like constantly changing too i'd imagine when it's outside mm -hmm. like throughout the day throughout the seasons as it as it weathers and and all these things so time. I guess the question generally is time. <laughs> what do you think of time? I was just going to say, I mean, with, with metal, putting it outside, you basically have to paint it unless you're, it's Corten or some aluminum or stainless steel. So, um, so, th so there that kind of leaves you, well, I can paint it white or I can paint it a color. Uh, <laughs> it costs the same um, to paint it. Uh, uh, yellow as it does to paint it uh, yeah I don't, those colors. I don't you know we don't know how these are gonna age yet but um I know like with salvage wings um I mean time became like a really important aspect of the project for us and thinking about um like how it could be disassembled and reassembled like originally when we pitched the project in the competition um you know part of the competition is to try to create a pavilion that is I think it was net zero waste was the term they were using. So like trying to use recycled materials. And so we were like, well, how can we also make it so it doesn't just end up going to waste after? And so the whole like flat packing, basically all these cross laminated timber panels flat pack. And so the idea like, um, or the kind of aspiration was that we could flat pack them and then rebuild it in other sites. Um, so we were really happy that we were actually able to do that. and. Now we've reassembled it twice, or we've assembled it on campus where we teach at University of Arkansas, and now it's at a children's museum in Arkansas. Um, so like that element of time became really important, and now we're waiting to see like how long is the wood gonna last, and um, you know when it gives out, we're wondering if we can mulch it or something like that. We're not really sure yet. Um, but the bus stops, like I don't know if we thought about the long span time. I mean I know there's a like the um, the city really wanted a 10 year, like that they could last for 10 years. And so they said it had to be metal or I think that was the only option they gave us. Um, uh, but we did think of it as like a prototype, uh, not for like other architectures, but just in and of itself. So like why there's two of them was we originally were commissioned for one, the red, white and black one, which we call the, the bulldog because it's like the University of Georgia football team, the, the bulldogs. Uh, colors and so we basically knew like because of the design we could change the colors out um, so we actually gave them like four other options for color schemes to do more of them we had like a b52's one that was like primary colors we had the peach state which is the one we did magnolia magnolias yeah magnolia county or magnolias i think those are true oh, that's the state flower maybe. i don't know anyway they were all like symbolic things um but it but so I don't know if that's about time, but only about time and that they could kind of replicate the same kind of design, yeah. but with different colors and make a new, um, yeah. a new piece, I guess. Sorry, so, I don't know if I answer your question. 
No, it's fine. I mean, the, these questions are just to spark conversation. You could talk about whatever you want to talk about. Uh, <laughs> but I think, um, I don't know, I was, uh, when you were talking about the, the giving options to the city to do as many, you know, other options for bus stops, right? I was curious about like the kind of how, did you pursue this project to begin with? Did the, sorry, unless I missed it, did, did the city reach out to you guys? Did you try offer up a bus stop for them? Like, because I- a, um, National like request for proposals. So kind of like a competition, but you had to submit a design and they actually selected, I think it was 10 artists. Mm -hmm. Like the city had specifically gotten a grant to build artist design bus shelters. And mm -hmm. so we just applied to that. And originally they told us that they really liked the design, so they might be interested in doing more than one. So we just push try to keep pushing to to get two. And that also helped us with the fabrication because doing two was easier, or you know, it, it was the fabricator that we found was way more interested in doing two than he was in doing one. Mm -hmm. But I, I guess I was asking the question because I think there are a lot of architects or young architects that would like to do more work that and kind of engaged a, a public audience or kind of uh, communities. Uh, but it's not necessarily clear how to get those projects. And if they're like we said at the kind of opening of the conversation, how to secure funding for these kind of works, I think is like a is a tricky thing like it's you know we're often presented with uh especially starting out like kind of you know single family residences which are you know typically have like wealthier clients when we w might want to be doing work that's uh maybe reaches a, a broader audience so it's it's just like a hard kind of area to navigate um also hold that thought I know that we're approaching the hour, so I do want to introduce the other project a little bit more formally. Um, and then I want to hear as well your thoughts on, you know, how you feel about this project, what you think are some things that we can take away from this one as well. I mean, I love this project. It's based in Tel Aviv. It's designed by Moju Architecture that is led by Fu Huang and Rakeli Rotem. Um, I think that they are based in New York. Um, Fu Huang describes himself as the alchemist of the studio and Rakeli is the futurist of their studio. And this was, like I said, 2015, it's a 2,500 square foot pavilion outside of the design museum, Holon. Um, and uh, it's there to inspire and to be the shelter for any kinds of outdoor activities. And so you have people reading books, playing games. Uh, the most exciting feature of this are these translucent plastic balls that kind of are constantly moving with the wind and they are made from recycled water bottles. And what that does is that it visualizes the movement of the wind into this interplay of light and shadow. And of course, you know, for me, uh, you know, Mark and I met as interns at SANA. It reminds us of the aesthetic of like completely white, pristine, serene architecture, mm -hmm. which is quite appealing. Um, and also recently something to interrogate as well. Um, but, you know, regardless of whatever we want to take away in terms of the color, I think that uh, this is just a really wonderful public space that, that, that this studio has created. So I just wanted to kind of introduce that and see if anybody has any further thoughts or any comparisons between the two projects. Well, I would ask like, okay, no, I won't. I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> like, do you like this project? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah we like it a lot. Okay. It's really cool. Um, I mean, like in terms of, I don't know. I mean, for us, it seemed like relatable. I mean, one the most obvious thing was like, we've been trying to think about motion a lot. Like, how do you just, I think at first because of the swings, like that's like literal motion. Mm -hmm. um, but then also like, um, and then here you have like the balls moving, which also is like a literal motion. Um, but we've been interested in that, like how you kind of, I guess, engage people 
um, or start to create different types of interaction in public spaces. And so like how this, the balls move around and as um, Rakawa was saying, like changes the light and changes, um, you know, kind of the atmosphere underneath the pavilion. Um, I don't know, to us that's really exciting and they do it through like a simple, simple um, means, I guess. <laughs> And also how you capture that motion in like a still drawing, that plan that has the kind of balls and gradients is, uh, or the one above that, yeah, um, is super interesting. And, and that's something we've, we've kind of been, it's a next project for us in terms of trying, of a drawing project to, to try to find ways to capture um, multiple frames of reference that exist within a single project, um, but in a 2D or in a uh, still image more, maybe more than an animation or like an animation can be a very literal, we'll tell you exactly what the balls are doing, but I, I don't know, I think the idea of translating it also into still graphics um, is intriguing. The project reminded us of this, um, this Brazilian artist, I don't, I always forget it, Rivon. Riveni Neuswander. Do you all know her? She had a show at New Museum like a few years ago, but she has a lot of projects that deal with kind of time and chance. And I think she even has like a very similar ceiling project that has like, it's an interior, but it has like styrofoam um, pieces that kind of move around with fans. So like reminded us of this a lot, um, but we've always liked her work and like, I don't know. Do you think that, um... Do you think that it gets like uh, we could incorporate motion and kind of play and stuff like that because of this again because of the scale of, of these things like do as architects get bigger projects do they lose some of these kind of freedoms of experimentation? I think we definitely do. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if everyone I don't know if Sana does, but yeah, I know like we're working on some um, how's a duplex and some kind of series of houses in Dallas right now and it's it's hard I mean it's scary I think is the biggest thing like as a young practice it's kind of scary to take the risks um when you're dealing with things people will live in versus like yeah. you know something that's a small structure uh, in a public space so yeah. for us we've been that's a great question because it's hard to jump scale I think yeah and maybe, yeah. maybe it doesn't need to I mean I'm not sure about that <laughs> I mean, there could be this thing of like, like Charles was talking earlier about, or y'all were talking about the whiteness, like how white rooms kind of are like a backdrop for, you know, life and all this color and activity. And I feel like most sauna projects are, to me, are like that. Or I think they, that Stan Allen that framed it as like dirty realism, kind of like all the stuff that goes on around it. And mm -hmm. um, uh, maybe like when you're at that scale, it doesn't need to be like shelter shift or like these projects that are really dense in color and interactivity maybe they are more of a backdrop or an infrastructure I'm not I'm not sure well i think it it, it has to do with the uh, the sort of user as well right like you said like you wouldn't want to live in these things but maybe kind of like this kind of experimentation could extend to larger public spaces Mm -hmm. that are not housing people or something right like you wouldn't want to necessarily live in a kind of circus tent but you might be able to visit it when you when you go to i don't know town hall or post office or something something like that yeah. um uh okay so i mean what are, are we we don't get like cut off there's not like a magical <laughs> Because we had started these on like Instagram Live, and it, it cuts you off at an hour, I think. Or or did I just imagine that whole scenario? For Instagram, yes. Oh, it does. Okay. All right. So we have um. We have the lightning round. We have a lightning round. Yeah, and then we we also have been asking uh part viewer participants if they have any questions to uh add them to the chat. Oh, but we've also been having the viewers also do the lightning round and chat it, <laughs> chat the answers into it, which is kind of fun. Uh, so maybe we'll, should we do the lightning round and then at the end ask for questions? That sounds good. Okay. All right. Uh, so I also want to say that Jessica and I might not answer the same for the lightning round. So. Um, okay. Yeah. So everybody, 
<laughs> just we'll we'll do we'll say the question then we'll do a one two three and then the people can type into their chat box their answer do we uh, type or chat you guys should you guys should just say it, say say it. it. Speak. Yeah, speak. <laughs> Uh, and you, I mean, if you really want a double answer, you could chat it as well. Okay, so the first one, these are really dumb questions. Uh, stripes or polka dots? Okay, so stripes or polka dots? One, two, three. Stripes. Polka dots. <laughs> it's just me. <laughs> I said stripes, but I actually think polka dots. I don't know. <laughs> I don't really like stripes. Um, we got a pretty, oh wow, who else? Polka dot? Carmen? Oh, Jackie. Hi, Jackie. Polka dots. Okay. <laughs> All right, so it's pretty mixed. <laughs> it's not, <laughs> not overwhelming. Because the uh, last time when there would be like one person left out, we'd uh, ask why. Uh, okay, in, uh, next question. Uh, this was also interesting because indoor, indoor versus outdoor. Because I saw that a lot of your, a lot of the publications about the salvage swing had, were like interior design related. <laughs> mind like oh these are outside but they do have insides anyways okay so the question is indoor or outdoor okay indoor or outdoor one two three <laughs> did anybody say indoor all these architects <laughs> and nobody said indoor that's pretty uh, typically i changed mine i'm supposed to be indoor um yeah <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm now actually a professor of interior design, not architecture, which is actually is, is kind of freeing. So, um, so I can say indoor with confidence. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I feel like architecture is a bit heavy sometimes. It's nicer yeah. to be on the side of... We've been indoors for way too long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. That, that's also true. Yeah, <laughs> maybe that's influencing it. Um, okay, am I just going to... Okay, uh, bus stop or train station? I don't know why <laughs> anybody has really strong opinions on this one. Uh, okay, one, two, three. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Bus stop, I don't know. Well, we did a bus stop. Oh, Georgine's here too. Hi, Georgine. Uh, yeah, did you guys, what did you say? Bus stop? Well, I kind of said hi. I don't know. They're so different. Okay. I, I would say re rephrase the question. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> How would you rephrase it? <laughs> they're so different though one Let's is say, monumental one the other is kind of more of a diffuse dispersed network um, okay uh <laughs> so yeah <laughs> singular but like one one outdoor bus stop and one outdoor train large station it doesn't matter <laughs> How to classify them. Uh, okay, the uh, next one's hot or cold? Hot or cold? Um, I don't know if we're talking about weather or drinks or moods or any of these things, but uh, one, two, three. And say cold. Hot. Hot. Uh, yeah. We thought you were talking about the Sarah Whiting article. Uh, <laughs> oh, notes on the Doppler that, that hot hotter, versus cool, cool architecture. Oh, oh, oh. I. Read that you, can read, you can put it on the foil reading list. Put it yeah. on the foil reading list. Yeah, we need that. <laughs> Let's get on that. Um, <laughs> no, I don't know. I think w for, for me, I, was, I wasn't I was that uh, intelligent with the question. I think it was just <laughs> any. Most people, cold, no. Most people said cold. I think it's we're in the South, so maybe we're thinking yeah. that. Cold lemonade sounds good. Yeah, I think like popsicles. There's something more soothing about that than hot. I don't know. Or like mm -hmm. cold. I was all. I my mind was going to, um, like a personality. If you're if you're kind of colder, I think you actually are less suspicious in some ways. <laughs> like you're not uh, hiding anything. I don't know what that means. Okay. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, the next question is swings or slides? <laughs> uh, yeah, swings or slides. Okay, one, two, three. I say swings. Yeah. 
slides are not great after childhood. They're, yeah. I was never, I outgrew slides really quickly, really quickly. I think more than your average person. Um, okay. Uh, are we doing all these yet? Okay, we'll move quicker. Moving or stationary? Moving or stationary? One, two, three. Moving. Yeah, see? Oh, stationary. We got a couple stationaries. Nice. So what's, why stationary? Um, well, I think that we've been moving a lot and <laughs> the, the pandemic has given us an opportunity to stop and just observe before we decide how to move. Um, that's my super deep reason. <laughs> <laughs> that's valid. Uh, we've also I, been... I am also reading uh, Jenny O'Dell's book um, and I, I, I hear where the, your stationary uh, <laughs> thinking is coming from. Yeah, that makes sense. Good. Uh, <laughs> you put that on the reading on the reading list. Added to the reading list. <laughs> um, okay, uh, Hatch or Phil? Hatch or Phil? Oh, got it. Okay, Hatch or Phil? One, two, three. I'd say Hatch. <laughs> Wow, some people said Phil. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to explain? <laughs> yeah. Zach, Dana, do we have any explanations here? <laughs> you can hop into video or chat or just ignore this. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> no, okay, good. Zach? <laughs> okay, it's fine. All right. Uh, <laughs> Class every uh, Zach has no <laughs> video. Convenient, Zach. Um, okay. Uh, the last question is metal or wood? More permanent sounds good. Okay, metal or wood? One, two, three. I'd say wood, wood I think. Wow. Oh, wow. That's, that's impressive. Yeah. Oh. No, Carmen said metal. Funny audio. I almost <laughs> Carmen is your is your dad, right? <laughs> why why metal? <laughs> it's screaming, okay. shouting into the nothingness. Um, that's interesting. I mean, last a couple of weeks ago, we were the discussion was brick or concrete, mm -hmm. and um, there was a debate whether brick was sort of nostalgic and not forward thinking which in this case, I guess, wood would take that place. Uh, but I don't know. I, I would say like, I think a lot of these questions were you were like counterintuitive to what you would think a kind of like, or what, uh, you know, an architect would want, like the kind of outdoors wood, like these are like smaller, more kind of craft driven things maybe uh that we've been seeing not even not just in these questions but in the past weeks uh which is maybe telling of something um okay we should wrap up relatively soon but if anybody has some last questions um or thoughts about uh anything that we've talked about today i was expecting to see it, the foil hat but i guess I know. I was going to. <laughs> it's we were going to on, but then I wasn't sure if that was good. <laughs> well, you know, given you know the introduction, we wanted to make sure it wasn't uh, anything wasn't perceived as like yeah. making fun of anything. But um, also, uh, I mean, Ricardo and I were saying this morning, like we've been so stressed out the last a uh, few times to do these little props to make these like they're that like leading up to them I'm like I'm like frantically yeah like taping <laughs> crowns to my head and like <laughs> cutting as fast as I can uh so it's been a little bit less stressful in that sense this week but um yeah I think we owe you some props so we'll have to <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll send them to you <laughs> A manner. To put my glasses on because they keep falling, so there's a prop right there. Okay. <laughs> glasses. Um, okay, well, are there any questions now? Do we have any final thoughts? I just 
just want to say thank you so much um, for joining and for sharing your work and your insights and your process. I think it's just so helpful and um, you know educational for everybody in the field, whether it's architects who are starting out or people who are in the middle of their careers to just be inspired and energized by these, uh, by these ideas. So I really appreciate that. Yeah. And thanks for being open to, um, you know, talking this week. And I think it's, it's been kind of tricky time for all of us to engage somewhere and, uh, we're really appreciative, appreciative to, um, be able to start, start up the conversations again and hopefully move things a little bit, uh, in the right direction. So thank you. And for everybody that joined, this is fun. Um, and we'll talk soon. I want to come to Arkansas also. Hey, sure. Absolutely, we everyone's have you at the school. <laughs> invited maybe once we're allowed to travel again. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Perfect. but thanks for having us and thanks everyone for yeah. listening. I, <laughs> this is really fun and really helpful for us. And I mean, thanks for doing the conversation at the beginning too. I think, you know, we're still learning how to engage these issues. So it's really nice to, to talk about it in a peer setting, so. Yeah. yeah. Okay, enjoy Sunday. Yes, you too. Bye, Bye. everybody.